This is a pie chart showing humanity's emissions by sector. Not only does this include the CO2 we have produced, but also the methane, nitrous oxides and other greenhouse gases that human activity releases. Now looking at the graph, the first thing which becomes obvious is that the biggest slice by far is energy. And that shouldn't be surprising given that nearly all our energy comes from burning fossil fuels. But it does highlight the urgent need for alternative energy sources. Fortunately, we already have many such options including wind, solar, hydroelectric, geothermal and nuclear. And renewable energy in general is becoming increasingly cheap and efficient. In fact, it could be argued that we are at the beginning of a clean energy revolution, with the cost of solar having fallen 90% in just 10 years, and both solar and wind are already competitive with, if not cheaper than fossil fuels. Either way, it's clear that if we want to stop the worsening effects of climate change, continued use of fossil fuels is just not an option. We have to fundamentally change how we get our energy. But while renewables could have a significant effect, there are some things like aviation and shipping which we currently don't have viable green alternatives for. This means that we can't completely eliminate this slice of the pie yet. It is worth noting, however, that nearly 40% of shipping is used for moving fossil fuels, so switching to renewables would eliminate that part overnight. Now clearly, short of destroying all the world's power stations and going to live in a cave, you and I can't do much to significantly reduce these emissions. But the decisions we make still play a role in how much we contribute to this slice of the pie. As you can see in the chart, road transport and the energy used by residential buildings contribute significantly to the global share of emissions, and the actions we take as individuals play a direct role here. If you can walk or cycle instead of driving, it's better for the environment and healthier for you. And if you can't do that, public transport is a good alternative. Of course, I realise that not everyone has these options, but many of us do, and if we can change our behaviour, it can make a real difference. If you're a frequent flyer, for example, maybe don't be, or at least consider flying less, or ideally not at all. This is because aviation is one of the most polluting forms of transport in existence, and though it might only make up 2% of global emissions, that's only because so few people do it. And if you're thinking, what are you talking about, Rosh? everyone flies, then you're probably living in a wealthy country where flying is normalised. For most of the world's population, it's an unaffordable luxury, and even in wealthy countries the majority of flights are taken by a minority of people. Similarly, the energy we use at home matters. Every time we use electricity to stream our favourite Netflix show, or turn the heating or aircon on, that's producing CO2. I'm not saying we need to live without electricity or heating, but just be aware of what you're using. Ask yourself if you really need to turn the heating up, or might a sweater do the trick? Basically, don't be needlessly wasteful. Incidentally, this is also why insulating buildings is important, as it reduces the amount of energy needed to heat homes, and it also saves money. But anyway, while all of these behavioural changes might help a little in the short term, over the long term it will all be for nothing unless we can kick the fossil fuel habit completely. Doing so would eliminate nearly three quarters of our emissions, but that on its own still leaves a fair chunk of the pie. So let's have a look at what remains. The next biggest share of emissions comes from agriculture, forestry and land use, and these emissions are considerably less straightforward to address. After all, we can't just stop eating. Now the simplest solutions involve changing farming practices and what we eat. Livestock and manure make up the biggest fraction of emissions here, so reducing the global consumption of beef and dairy could have a significant effect. And yes, that means the vegans have a point. Now if you're panicking about losing your steak and burgers, don't worry. You don't need to go vegan or even vegetarian to make a difference. Just cutting back on your meat consumption, and in particular your beef and dairy, will go far, and the more we all collectively cut back, the greater the impact will be. Similarly, protecting forests and re-greening the planet could eliminate the emissions from deforestation, and banning the practice of crop burning would also be significant. But unfortunately, some of these emissions are unavoidable. Rice fields, for example, generate methane due to bacteria in their waterlogged soils, and while we could, in theory, try to consume less rice, it is currently the staple crop for literally billions of people, which makes giving it up unrealistic to say the least. 
This means that it's probably impossible to completely eliminate all agricultural emissions, and so we have to find ways of offsetting them, perhaps by restoring biodiversity. So with agriculture and energy covered, we've already accounted for nearly 90% of human emissions, which is pretty significant. Addressing these two sectors alone would more or less halt global warming in its tracks. But since every greenhouse gas molecule we produce matters, we may as well look at the remaining emissions. So next on the list we have industry, and like agriculture, these emissions are going to be very hard to reduce. We all need cement and concrete if we want to build houses and maintain our basic infrastructure, but CO2 emissions are a direct and unavoidable byproduct of cement production. Similarly, greenhouse gases are a byproduct of the production of many industrial chemicals that we require to maintain modern civilization. There are no easy, pollution-free alternatives yet, and so reducing these emissions will require a combination of technological innovation and perhaps a reduction in our use of these products. This is also an area which we as individuals have very little control over. The best we can do is vote for policies which attempt to address it. And that brings us on to the last and smallest slice of the pie, the emissions produced from the decomposition of waste. Again, these emissions are on some level unavoidable since decomposition is a natural process, so it's fortunate that they are relatively insignificant compared to energy and agriculture. But even so, we can still reduce these emissions by simply reducing our waste. Every year, humanity throws away over a billion tons of food, which is frankly obscene, particularly given how much CO2 is produced to grow it in the first place. So if we all made an effort to only buy what we need, and then actually use what we buy, we could significantly reduce this needless waste, while also reducing the emissions from agriculture. Reusing and recycling plastics and other non-edible waste are also important here, but again, individual actions can only get us so far. We need better policies and intelligent waste management infrastructure so we don't keep creating massive piles of decomposing junk all over the place. And again, if you live in a wealthy country, you may be unaware of the scale of this problem, because our governments have historically shipped our waste to developing countries where it ends up in some landfill site, polluting someone else's water and poisoning someone else's kids. Perhaps if it was piling up in our own backyards rather than someone else's, we take the problem a little more seriously. Just some food for thought. So that's about everything. By now it should be clear that there is no single solution to climate change because there are so many different activities contributing to greenhouse emissions. This means that if we want to stop greenhouse gases from increasing in the atmosphere, then we have to employ multiple solutions to address the multiple causes. That includes deploying renewable energy, changing agricultural practices, adjusting our eating habits and becoming less wasteful. It requires effective environmental policies, green investment, technological ingenuity as well as changes in our behaviour and collaboration between nations. Individuals can't solve climate change on their own, but neither can corporations or governments. We need everyone involved. Because put bluntly, global heating is going to keep getting worse as long as we keep screwing with the composition of the atmosphere. So maybe we should, you know, try to stop with a little more urgency before it starts to get really hot. If you've enjoyed this video and found it informative, then don't forget to help the algorithm with a like and a comment. A lot of time and effort goes into making these videos, so I always appreciate your support. And if you want to see more of my content, then make sure to smash that subscribe button and hit the bell icon so you can be notified whenever I upload. Also, check out my other videos. If you've enjoyed this, you'll probably like them. Thanks for watching, and until next time, goodbye.